This February, history will be made. Millions will watch as 80 years of unjust stigma is left in the past. A product that drove good people to the black market will be revealed as one that's creating a new global market. This February, what inspired the symbol of counterculture will at long last be seen as just culture. The new normal is coming. Will you be one of the first to see it? Visit MedMen.com to watch an exclusive preview. Welcome, everyone, to Creating a Family. Talk about adoption and infertility. Today, we're going to be talking about parenting tips for lying, stealing, and other annoying behavior. Uh, If you're a parent over the age of a child over the age of a toddler, you have probably experienced some of these behaviors, and you have probably also been flummoxed by these behaviors. This is the show for you. I'm Dawn Davenport. I am the director of Creating a Family. We are the National Adoption and Infertility Education and Support Nonprofit, and you can find us online at creatingafamily.org. We have an online adopted center for parents where we can where we have one hour courses that you can use either pre adoption as part of your adop- required adoption training or post adoption to make you a better parent. We have courses on all types of challenging, annoying behaviors, including a course on lying and stealing, but lots of other uh, challenging behaviors that uh, present parenting challenges, let's put it that way. We have an extensive list of these courses with really exceptional experts. I strongly encourage you to go to our website, creatingafamily.org, hover over the word online education and click on Uh, for parents, parent education. And it will take you to our online center. On the right-hand side is a sorting mechanism, so just play around there. Um, And you can find just, we have over 100 courses, so needless to say, you can find a course on just about any topic you are curious about or are looking for. The Creating a Family radio show is proud to say that we are underwritten by our corporate sponsor, not a corporate sponsor, actually, we're underwritten by, they're not a corporation, by the Jockey Being Family Foundation. Their mission is to strengthen adoptive families through post-adoption services. That is, as you know, a topic near and dear to everyone here at Creating a Family's Heart. As their founder, Deborah Waller, says, one failed adoption is one too many. Amen. I can only say amen. You can support their mission by buying a bear or a blanket at jockeybeingfamily.com. And we thank them sincerely for their support. Uh, In addition to Jockey Being Family, we have other partners at Creating a Family whose generosity allows us to bring you this show. Some of our wonderful partners include MLJ Adoptions. They are a nonprofit Hague-accredited adoption agency serving families across the U.S. who are interested in growing their families through international adoption. They also offer home study services to residents of Indiana. And we have Holt International. They were founded in 1956 and want every child to have a loving and secure home. They have programs that strengthen and preserve families that are at risk of separation, and they lead the global community in finding families for children who need them by providing and providing the pre- and post-adoption support they need to thrive. As I mentioned, today's show is going to be covering a topic that is truly near and dear to the hearts of all parents. We're going to be talking about those behaviors that it's hard to figure out how to parent, how to discipline, how to help correct our kids, because quite frankly, sometimes there's not the natural consequences, or the natural consequences are so far off, it's hard to uh, to utilize those. Uh, I'm a mom of four, and I found lying to be one of the hardest, one of the hardest behaviors uh, to parent through. Uh, and I, I really appreciate uh, the experts and the wisdom from this show. We'll be talking to Kim John Payne. He is the author of The Soul of Discipline, The Simplicity Parenting Approach to Warm, Firm, and Calm Guidance from Toddlers to Teens. 
He's also has been a family counselor for over 30 years and is the father to two teenagers. We also have Rebecca Rosima. She is an adoption social worker with Bethany Christian Services. She is also the mom of five sons. This show has been one of our more popular shows, and so this is that we're re-airing it. It's been a number of years, quite a, a number of years since we uh, aired it the first time. We are re-airing it because it has been so popular, and because when I listened to it again uh, a couple of months ago, I was still so impressed by the information that was given. Enjoy. Welcome, Kim Payne and Rebecca Rosema, to Creating a Family. Thank you, Dawn. You know, I assume most children lie at times, or maybe I want to assume that because as the mom of four, I certainly know that that we have experienced that. Um, And I'm not really sure how helpful it is to break these behaviors I mentioned down uh, into into their separate behaviors, but we're going to start with that approach. Uh, Of all the behavioral challenges I have found in in my parenting career, uh, I've found lying to be the hardest to figure out how to effectively handle. And and it seems to me, and I've, I've thought about it a lot, it seems like the natural consequences are often so far removed from the behavior and and are also they are all too nebulous sometimes for my kids to really understand or at least it felt that way the fact that you know that that the ultimate consequence of lying is that they lose my trust really didn't at times seem to be enough or the implication of that where it was too undefined for them to grasp so uh I, I really found it to be, uh, particularly for some of my kids, to be just, for me, a very challenging um, behavior. Um, what ages are most common for, for lying? Rebecca, let's start with you on that one. Well, I would say that, first of all, it is a developmental task for children to go through lying. Um, that is how they determine what's right and wrong and start to develop that conscience. Um, So when they start lying, then you can feel good about that because they are learning that there is a wrong. Um, That doesn't make most parents feel great because their child is trying to get away with something, but um, they do have to accomplish that task in order to move forward with wanting to be honest. Um, Lying starts with a lot of... Let me ask this. Is, are very young children really capable of intentionally lying? I mean, at some age, isn't developmentally, don't they have to reach a point before they kind of get the concept of, of telling the truth versus uh, versus a non-truth? Right. It's really in that early childhood, three, four-ish, that they're doing some more of the um, non-intentional lying, where if you question them and if that's the truth or a story, um, that they'll be able to identify that it's a story. Um, When they get to be five or six, seven for sure, then they're able to intentionally lie. Um, And then from there on up, obviously Mm -hmm. they are capable of telling an intentional lie. You know, um, Kim, is it important to understand the reasons for a lie. I mean, if you go online and you read, even now, I, I was at a lecture once um, early in my um, parenting career, and the uh, psychologist, and honestly, I don't remember who it is and probably wouldn't use their name now, said the only reason children ever lie is because they're afraid of their parents' behavior, afraid of their parents' reaction or whatever. And and I thought, you know, that is so naive. <laughs> that is so not – there are so many different reasons that children might – you know, and, and might not tell the truth. And uh, certainly one of them, you know, might be fear of parents who have overreact and, and abuse them. But but it's also equally true, I think, that children sometimes don't tell the truth because they don't, they know that if they tell the truth, uh, you know, the, the classic one or the, certainly one we've heard, do you have homework? Well, the kid will say no because they know if they say yes, they have homework, that at some point between now and dinner time, they will have to sit down and do the homework and they would prefer to go out and play or prefer not to have to do it at all. So there, so there. I think are probably many reasons for lying. But is it important for us as parents to understand the reason for the lie? Well, picking up on what Rebecca said, you know, the the um, lying to to actually, you know, have an alternative picture of how something went, you know, is absolutely. Uh, Rebecca, I'd agree. Those those um, 
two developmental thresholds, round three or four, you mentioned, around seven. It comes up a lot around nine or ten again. And then it goes, and then it comes up a lot around uh, fourteen, fifteen, and you'll notice that these are there's gaps in between. So what tends to happen with with children's lying and other things? You know, stealing definitely, uh, sibling rivalry definitely. A lot of the things that come up tend to come up at developmental thresholds. So Rebecca mentioned it's a developmental task. And then if you extend that a little further, you've got developmental thresholds. It's like when they walk through a doorway into a new developmental stage. So neurologically, things are really changing. Um, and what you start to see is that when you, you, you think around three or four, you've dealt with it, and the child, uh, you know, and you, and you pat yourself on the back and you think as a parent, you know, I, I've been thinking this, oh, gosh, five or six oh, that's better, you know, not so much lying or stealing or cheating going on now. And then around six, seven, it comes up again, you know, just as you were beginning to consider running uh, parenting workshops or something. Exactly. The, yeah, just about when you're patting yourself on the back and you go, boy, nip that sucker in the bud. But no, sir. Yep. <laughs> and then up it comes around nine. Nine is what um, is what I often think of as a as sort of a cuspian age. And they're not little kids. They're not big kids and they're right on the edge and then teenage is another cusp they're not they're not they're not um tweenagers but they're not adults yet so basically what i'm saying is that where you see these three stooges come up <laughs> like, when you see these come up it's usually it's not a sign that you're doing badly as a parent it's a sign that the that your kid is feeling disoriented, and that for me is the biggest and most helpful uh, piece that's got me through my own parenting in years as a family ca- a counselor. Is that there there are no such thing. I've never met a disobedient child in my life, and I've I've met some right little rascals. I can tell you, you know, um, uh, I've never met a disobedient child in my life. Only a disoriented one, and. The, the disorientation happens more intensively at times when our kids are going through changes. And that's why the lying and stealing and cheating and sibling rivalry and defiance tends to come up a little bit more when they're ending one phase of childhood and beginning another because they're feeling a little bit lost. And when a kid feels lost, they're going to push out and try and in a sense, um, reach out and push back against against the boundaries that we have put in place. Okay, let me use, use let's use the example of your child coming home from school, and you say, "Do you have homework?" And the child says, "No," when in fact they do. Um, how is that evidence of our children feeling disoriented, as opposed to feeling like they would rather not do their homework? Well, one of the things to to one of the sort of tools to use when your children lie that is almost universal and it begins at at what Rebecca mentioned at about three or four one can use this strategy a little bit is is it is to understand that in order for a child to tell a lie they have to develop an inner picture otherwise how could they tell the lie in the first place they've they've their limbic system in their brain has developed a little alternate picture Right, so and that comes out as an untruth, as a lie. So, otherwise, they wouldn't they wouldn't know how to do it. So, one of the things to say to a child when they tell a, just a downright porky pie, as we say in England, um, a, a lie, is that um, is to say to them, "Oh, gosh, you know, John or Joan, that's I can see that you really would have liked for it to have been like that." I can tell that would have been much better. And if you know, if, if they've taken something, for example, or they've told a lie, I can see that you would like that to have been just like you said. I wonder how we can make it like that. Let's figure out how we can make it just as you wish it was. So in a sense, it's turning a lie into a wish. And then you're unstuck. Then you're moving. Because if you, ch- if you just simply challenge the lie... And just say, you know, you, you, a challenge is okay. You might say, oh, Jonathan, um, oh, you know, Jeremiah, you, we we don't tell tell those kinds of lies in our family. But I can see that you would wish 
it was just like you said. Um, we always try and be as truthful as we can. And let's see if we can help you make it just like you want. You know, every time you do that for a young child, it's kind of remarkable how things ease up. Well, and, and that might work if you know that the child is uh, is telling a lie. But uh, what if you don't? What if you don't know whether the child has homework or or uh, who broke the cookie jar or whatever the you know the the, the situation is? And you and so you don't know. Let, let's go ahead and move into the tools, which is what we were starting to talk about. Um, uh, Rebecca, some thoughts, uh, and I'm going to come back to you then after this, to back to Kim. Let's talk about some tools that are effective for helping to teach children um, to not lie. Oh, that is the, the good question, Don. Um, I think, first of all, I going on what Kim said as well, like if you know that a child's lying, then don't give them the opportunity to lie to you. If you know that they have homework um, and they haven't gotten it out of their backpack yet, um, instead of asking them if they have homework, then one of the things I always recommend parents to do is, you know, it's Monday. I know you have math homework, so can you go get your math homework for me? Um, instead mm-hmm. of asking them if they have it, um, so that it's such a especially good point. Yeah. especially for kids that I'm working with who have some adoption and trauma history, typically um, they can get so caught up in that that response um, of of what the parent is going to say that they may right away tell a lie um, just out of that impulse that they always have done before because that's what's so deeply ingrained in them that they have to tell a lie about something and it becomes their natural response so instead Mm -hmm. of giving them that opportunity to just say go get it for me please um, a lot of times when kids are telling those stories um, again as Kim said too you know it is that how it really went? Is that how you would have liked it to go? Um, Can we make that work? Um, If it's not something that you can make work, then then coming up with an alternative of maybe how they can earn something similar or um, get a different reward. Another thing that I find really important is um, I lost it. It was in my head. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, how that does happen. I it tell you does. what, I'm going to come. Just, I'm going to give you a second to remember it. I'll go back to Kim and we'll okay. come back to you. All right, Kim, uh, one of the techniques that surprisingly, or was surprising to me, that worked really well for one of my children. He was a, we called it a grip it and rip it type of guy. He uh, acted first, thought second, uh, and, uh, um, and it was just his almost his knee jerk without thinking he would say something. And you're probably right. It, it, I suspect now thinking back, it really did happen on those cusp years, those cusp, develop, cusp de- developmental times. But when we were going to ask him something that was hard, we didn't know, we would tell him up front, take your time in answering. It's okay to say, I don't know, to buy yourself some time, even yes. though it might – I don't know, might be even a silly answer to, uh, you know, did you break the cookie jar or something like that? You know, I don't know. But but we accepted that because I don't know gave him time to process. Um, and then mm-hmm. he could, after he processed, he would come back and more often than not uh, would at that point tell the truth. So uh, have you seen that to work with other kids as well? Yeah, it's it's. I'm not sure is the term. We, we're on very parallel <laughs> ground here, yeah. actually, Dawn. I'm not sure um, is 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 another way you can buy kids time, particularly in in the um, with, with adoptive children, because one of the things that that I've found, having worked a lot with um, children, I worked in um, war torn areas with um, uh, children without families at all, uh, not foster, not adoptive, just in in refugee camps. And one of the things that I found in those sort of very high stress situations is that that kids need that they simply need more time to process. Again, neurologically. 
the synaptial activity, just just the kind of the distance between an act and the empathy um, out of which the out of the, which the understanding of the act comes, takes a few more heartbeats. It takes just a little more time. So one of the things to to understand about children in stress situations is they they go into their fight or flight brain, as we all know, very quickly into that amygdala, into that ancient brain. And that brain tends to close the doors for a little while, a few seconds, which in neurologically is a long while, um, until they understand that there's safety. So on what your approach um, did, for, I, I suspect, um, for your son, and lucky boy to have that approach, and mum doing that, is that it allowed the doorways to the, the old fight or flight brain to actually open because they'll open if they realize there's non-judgmental safety. If they realize they're not going to be judged and that things are safe, you know, you might remember back to, I remember back to Eric Erickson, Psych 101, you know, when I was in college where he said, for the, for the first 30 months of life, all a child wants to know is, am I safe? Am I not safe? Can I trust? Can I not trust? Well, that's a developmental stage that Erickson um, so poignantly uh, describes in his writing. But for many children in a high stress environment, that is still a latent, that's, that question is still kicking around. Am I safe? And in situations where a child is tempted to lie or steal or cheat, it usually is a self-protective gesture. It's usually their survival self or, su or their survival brain kicking in. And so the most important thing to do when a child gets into a little bit of a habit of lying um, or cheating or stealing is to understand they need more time. And this goes, this is a micro and macro timing thing. And the micro, you can just say what, just like you said, Dawn, you know, um, Oh, do you need a little more time, or yeah, and just give them that on a but on a macro level. I think a lot of the the benefits of for children in the adoptive situation come when life itself can operate at a little bit of a slower click. I th our children are living in a world of just too much, too soon, too young, too sexy. And it's. I wrote about this extensively in, in my um, one of my previous books called Simplicity Parenting, where the new normal of the fever-pitched, fast-paced life has has really now it, it just slips under the radar. Like I said, it's become the new normal. And I found that this particularly affects children who who are in new and adapting, they're not just adopting, of course, they're adapting themselves to a new environment. So the benefits of living life at a slower pace, less scheduling, less play dates, less sports teams, less screen media, less adult information that, that, that kind of scares them. It's that power of less, which is so super important for children who are adapting and, ado and, and who are in an adoption situation. Then the lying and stealing and cheating slows down because the, the neurologically they're not in what I think of as either pushback, that's more the fiery kids who will push back when they don't feel safe, or um, the more introverted kids will fall back and they become sullen and unapproachable. And when you see a kid pushing back and fall or falling back, depending on their extrovert or introvert temperament, it's usually a sign that one of the best things we can do is just dial life back and then the cheating, lying and stealing tends to ease up Usually within a relatively short period of time, you start to see them relax and therefore not need to defend themselves with those sorts of behaviors. So it's a lifestyle question as much as anything else. 
I love that. And, you know, it occurs to me as you're speaking, it is not just children who have experienced trauma. It can also be children mm-hmm. who have uh, learning disabilities or processing disabilities or children who have uh, had uh, brain damage caused by exposure to alcohol or drugs prenatally. Uh, I think all of these children uh, could use the slowing down uh, I think slowing it a notch down, just slowing everything a notch down, um, mm-hmm. or at least that's certainly what I have seen. That that it uh, it just buys them time. Yeah. Um, what about um, the idea of giving do-overs, um, Rebecca? How is that? Or first, let me say, did you remember what you were thinking of? If so, I you did. Bring that I up. yeah. Oh, okay. I bring that one up now, <laughs> then we'll talk to her. <laughs> You um, see, we gave you more time, Rebecca. I know. <laughs> yeah, there thank you. Go. My brain needed to have a little bit of time there. I, I, um, we just, I think we just simplified life a little for you. There you right, go. Right, you did. Um, I think it's too important that we let kids know that there are going to be times that they're going to be able to pull one over on us. Um, so, especially with my oldest, I he's he's going to be able to get one by me. Um, and there's some of that testing in this pre-adolescence of our mom and dad all knowing, um, and we're not. And so just letting him know that right off the bat at times can help with some of those behaviors because then he doesn't need to test it out quite so much because he knows that we're not going to catch him every time. And when we catch him, then there will be consequences and nice talks and things like that. But that we're not going to catch him every time. So there's some of that developmental aspect as well of trying to figure out how much do mom and dad really control my life and how much do they really know. (laughs) Yeah, okay, I can actually, um, yeah, I can see that that could be effective. I have not ever thought about that, but, yeah, I always figured my kids had figured that out pretty quickly. (laughs) I didn't catch him at a lot of the stuff, so it was like they knew that. But you're probably right by having, um, if I had uh, specifically told them. Yeah. All right. You are listening to Creating a Family, and today we're talking about, I like that uh, uh, Kim John Payne called it the three stooges of parenting, you know, lying, steeding, and chilling. That's what we're talking about today. And creating a family has the largest adoption and infertility infertility communities on the social networks, and we would love to have you join us. There are three ways to connect with us on Facebook. You can uh, connect with me personally. I'm Dawn.Davenport1. You can also uh, like our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash creatingafamily, or you can join our very active Facebook support group. It is a closed group on Facebook, so you have to request to join, and only those members of the group can see the post. Uh, And you can find that at facebook.com slash groups slash creating a family. We also have uh, are active on Pinterest and Twitter, and you can find us on both of those at creating a family. All right, let's come back now to the – we're still kind of on the toolbox uh, category here, uh, giving do-overs. Uh, Rebecca, thoughts on that? Uh, the, if you think you've caught your child or you know you've caught your child in a lie, um, Number one, we've talked about if we think there's a possibility of a lie, we know our child is struggling, don't give them the opportunity to lie. Don't ask the question. Make the assumption and, and, and work from there, although that's not always effective, but still, that that's one approach. But let's say we actually uh, we have asked and, and we are very suspicious that we have not gotten the truth. Um, and so what about the idea of do-overs? Or is that just encouraging, you know, lying because we're we're allowing them to, make it, you know, make it right, you know, by by doing it over again. You know, I like the idea of do-overs and I use them quite a bit in my household. Um I go back to that instinctual response that kids have um when they're fearful and they're in that fight, flight and freeze mode of their brain. And if I've caught them there and they lie, but they're able to show some remorse, um if they're a child who is going to need to learn to tell the truth and see what happens when the truth comes out, then they need to rewire their brain um, to see that the truth is something that's not so scary. So allowing them to have that do-over, that doesn't mean that we don't still have a discussion 
a do-over doesn't mean that a consequence may not still come from whatever the lie was, um, but they're able to give the right answer, the honest answer, and typically the consequence is much less from being able to tell me honestly than if they continue to lie about the situation even after it's been caught. I'm glad you brought up consequences, and and I guess I wanted to talk about that some. Um, Kim, the consequences often of lying are further removed than than, than Mm -hmm. would be ideal from the behavior. Ideally, you know, the consequences immediately, it's far easier to, you know, the, the stove is hot, you reach up and touch the stove, you get a burnt hand, that, you know, and so you very quickly learn that, you know, reaching up and touching the stove is a bad idea. But so often with lying, uh, number one, you can get away with it, uh, and there will be, never, you will not be caught. But number two, even if you are caught, oftentimes it's down the road before the consequences hit. Um so so how effective are consequences? Are there things that we can do as parents to make the consequences more, not necessarily more real, but more timely Well, and, and or more well, real? Yeah, I mean, kids, you've got to be, I find one has to be very careful with consequences because our kids start to develop consequence immunity, like consequence calluses. That we, you know, when we apply consequences over and over and over to kids, they start to actually game the system. They start to just uh, to switch off a little bit and kind of whatever, you know, and and that's not good. What, what we've got to, I think, be careful of is rejection-based discipline because consequences often can edge towards, you know, the timeouts, the rejection, the, that feeling that you've done something bad and... If we if we sort of send kids to their room, for, which is a classic consequence, I, I wonder the, the, what the, the message that that's communicating to kids. Like when you got a problem, send it away. I wonder what that's going to do for their future marriages. When you got a problem, get rid of it, send it away. I'm a much bigger fan of when. That when a lie or a horrible situation comes up with with sibling stuff, um, um, I I found it much more effective, and, and countless numbers of of families have because we we train um, simplicity parenting uh, coaches all around the world, and so this this is on many many different continents. We've trained about a thousand people, and so we get a lot of feedback from people all over the world. Um, And one of the things that I've found as an alternative to consequences is rather than a a time out is this well, we're becoming well known now time in and sitting with a child, um, particularly uh, Rebecca was talking before about sort of seven, eight, nine year olds that you can really start to do this. And if there's been a situation that has come up that's caused a child to lie or steal, or have a, a real conflict with a sibling, you know, it's really important, I find, to be able to say, okay, you get the two kids together if there's been an accusation of lying or horrible things happened, and just say, look, I want you to tell me one thing that you take responsibility for, and you get to make one request. Okay, so you can tell me one thing that you take responsibility for. And that's where often the confession, so to speak, comes up. You know, okay, well, you know, I mean, I, I didn't like mean to call him like, you know, and you get the, you get the, because he totally denied calling him a fat pig or something awful. And now the confession, well, I didn't mean it, but okay, well, what's your request? Well, don't go into my room and like take my baseball mitt without asking me because that was grandpa's mitt and he gave it to me. Almost always, the reason I'm giving this example is almost always when there's a lie comes up or when something happens, there is a backstory. There's a backstory. If you say to a child, have you got homework? And they know they've got math, um, as Rebecca was saying, you know, in their backpack. The backstory is they're feeling overwhelmed with too much homework, which is one of the great ills of modern time is the fact that homework and high-stressed kids, it's all, that's become the new normal as well. And Or it is that you know, there's something they really wanted to do with a friend. They re- they wanted to go out and play basketball. And so there's a, there's almost always a story behind a behavior. And what's important 
is to have accountability without shame and accountability without blame. And it's not that you're just going to sit down and have a nice, quiet, gentle talk with a child and off they skip and they've got their own way. That's no good at all because there's been no boundary recognition. There's been no understanding that, that we just don't do this in our family. And that's got to be said. We just we, we don't do this. I, um, I call it the D-A-D-D. The D is first just disapprove. Like, whoa, you know, Juliana, we just don't speak like that in our family. We, we try really hard to always be straight and tell the truth. Now, I, and that's the, that's the D. And then the second A, just while we're talking about toolbox, Dawn, you know, the A is approve. Say to a child, Juliana, I know that you so often are straight. You so often tell it just like it is. Um, for you to, to, to say something like that, there must be something up. Now, this is the third part. So we've, we've disapproved. We've affirmed that a child's words are different from their intrinsic being by affirming her. Do, do you see? She's not totally a lie. You know, Juliana's whole life is she's not a liar. She's told a lie. That's so different. It's really, really different that Juliana still knows that she's loved that she still knows her mama or her daddy still sees that she's a good kid and that she often, often tells the truth. And then the third D is to, is to discover and say, what's up? I call that the New Jersey question. Sup. They, they really say that in New Jersey. Sup. What's up? Sup. And she can, she can say, well, you know, like the example I gave before, he comes into my room and just takes my stuff. So, okay. So what's up is that you felt that, that, you know, that your little brother really did something that he shouldn't do. Yes. And now, and Dawn, this is, thanks for bearing with this, because now comes the, the last D, which is the do-over. But the do-over is effective, I find, only if Juliana knows that, that she shouldn't do it. That's the first D, disapprove. The do-over is only effective if you affirm her that she's a good kid and often doesn't steal, doesn't cheat, doesn't lie. That's the A. And then particularly, Juliana can only do a do-over if she, if she, if she, her little story has been heard. If her story has been heard, the chances of her doing a do-over or even apologizing, even saying, I'm sorry, Mama, but... Then you haven't said, Juliana, you say sorry right now, and she'll say so uh, 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 sorry. You know, it's not. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's not, it's not she great. will. <laughs> but there's three steps before asking a kid to apologize or do over. And those are the three that I just outlined. And in the do-over stands a really high likelihood of working out. My kids have totally got this down when they've told a lie or steal you know, or done something that they shouldn't have done. I just tell them absolutely straight they shouldn't do it. I tell them absolutely straight that they don't often do that and I love them anyway. And then absolutely straight, tell me what's going on. And then the do-over, it kind of almost takes care of itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would imagine it would at that point because they're feeling safe enough at that point and, and loved enough at that point to uh, um, to uh, to do it yeah. on their own. Yeah. And this only takes like, 30 seconds i'm not suggesting we sit down light candles smudge the room and go into a trance-like state and sway in the wing, wind wind and sing kumbaya this is quick because we've got to get out the door to school i mean it has to be very when you do when you get good at this d-a-d-d thing it becomes second nature and it's done quick and it's done in the car it's done it's very practical and then and it seems to me that there's kind of a something that we haven't talked about and that is the the idea of of looking for opportunities when they are telling when they do especially if they're in that 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 cusp time where we we see that they're um sliding into the lying stealing cheating type behavior um is to look for times when they're when they're not doing that to reward times when they told the truth when it would be hard are they um uh, they 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 lost at a game that you know because they they could have cheated but they didn't, uh, and how much you enjoy playing with them because that type of thing. So I mean, how important? Uh, and, and Rebecca, I'll, I'll ask this to you: How important is rewarding telling the truth or rewarding uh, not cheating that type of thing? I think it's very important to point out when our children are doing well with very specific praise. 
um, not just the, hey, that was really great, but um, one of my boys broke a drawer the other day and had the perfect opportunity to blame it on one of his little brothers. And we actually thought it was one of the little brothers. And for him to say, no, it was really me, we made a very big deal about, Mm -hmm. thank you for telling the truth. Thank you for not blaming it on one of your little brothers. And what would that have done to that relationship? Um, So making sure that we find those times to let them know how proud we are of them for taking those steps and it doesn't have to be a huge situation for us to praise them. Um, it can just them be them being honest about really wanting a snack and wanting to go take it but not doing it. Um, and then, mm-hmm. But we have to notice that. We have to notice that they walked into the kitchen and we're in the snack drawer and then yeah. closed it without taking it. And that's hard when, with our busy lifestyles. Yeah, um, I think there's a lot, too, what Kim said about, you know, when you've got a big family or you're really busy juggling lots of things and there is this societal pressure to have kids involved in things, and, and that's yes. not always best for them. No, and there's almost a, a, a subliminal competition, or maybe not even subliminal, competition amongst parents of – my son is in three sports and doing so well, and by golly, is learning Mandarin, and we're thinking about adding Turkish. You know that type of, you know, where you listen to him, and 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 then you think, gosh, you know, my kid is basically, you know, mastering mud pies, and you feel like that's we really aren't measuring up here. And then sometimes you feel like, well, it's because I have a large family that that my kids don't get this, so I'm I'm depriving them. Um, and I so agree with what Kim said. We are so not depriving our children when we uh, we, we don't let them get over involved. And I'll and then I'll, I'll change the subject. But something is, my kids are older now. They're you know in, in, in latter teens, and some even you know in college and beyond. Um, what I found is that particularly my very high energy kids, by the time they because they weren't over involved when they were younger. There came a time, particularly with uh, my very high, one of my very high energy sons, where at middle school and early uh, high school, I really wanted him to be exhausted, and exhaustion was my friend, and so he he could get involved as much as he wanted then, and he had not burnt out. He was thrilled to be able to play, you know, three seasons of sports, and uh, because he had never done it before, so there is that advantage that um, if they haven't been over involved, there may come a time in your life when you want them tired and you want them really fully <laughs> engaged uh, in, uh, in in productive activities. So there's, there is that. Um, a question I have that, and I should have looked up some examples uh, before the interview, so I'm hoping you guys can think of it. If you can't, I'll uh, send it out and, and, and post some tomorrow in the blog. Uh, what I found amazingly effective with all of my kids for all sorts of lying, cheating, stealing, and other annoying behaviors is the power of stories and books. It uh, takes it away from being personal. We're reading about a dog, for gracious sakes, or we're reading about, you know, a kid in a book. We're not talking about you. Uh, but the stories that focused on um, uh, a moral compass, and uh, you know, regardless of if, if it's uh, and and how uh, the advantages of 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 telling the truth, the advantages of not stealing when it was easy to have done that, things like that. Um, First of all, let me ask Kim: Have you found that to be helpful uh, in uh, in your practice as well? And then, can you think of any examples of of, of books? Which, of course, is a hard question because it sort of really depends on the age of the child. Yeah, you know, one of the things uh, with the power of story is that it's it's a it's a super highway out of the fight, flight, freeze, or flock brain reaction. A, a story is so it's it's just like this great big invitation into a warmer place and we don't have to be experts at stories because we have a lifetime of stories within us as parents and particularly working if you if you if uh, you've adopted a child this is one of the beautiful things that you can do is to not be necessarily have to come up with some you know publishable fable that you could tell <clears throat> but tell a child in when they're in a situation 
um, that, that is where they've got stuck. They've got stuck. They've been caught cheating, or they've 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 they're in they're in a pushback or a fallback position. You know, they're pushing us away, or they're or they're pulling away from us. Is tell a child about your own life, a little story about how you remember what it was like when, uh, you know, and then you can say to a child, you know, I remember when I was nine. And the beautiful thing about this is that it gives a child situational biography. And what I mean by that is that when push comes to, well, love, <laughs> um, when, when that moment comes up, I think one of the things that defines us as a family is not just Christmas and you know, the holiday season or it's not just the wonderful times. What defines us as a family, as a newly forming family or any family, it are the tough times and how we deal with them. That's what defines us, I would say, more than, than, than most things, more than the good times. And when the tough times come up, it's an ideal opportunity to be able to give to a child who's finding his or her way into this beautiful new family a little bit of relevant biography because then it's relevant because you're saying, I remember when there was a time when I was uh, nine years old when I went to my mother's purse and I and she said I could take five cents and I took 25. And then she asked me how much money I'd taken. And I didn't say anything. And she said, have you taken more? And I said, no. By the way, I'm not making this up. Um, and... Um, <laughs> and um, and to you know, and to my shame, still I'm in my fifties now, and I, to my shame, I still I still remember the shame of that. And I don't have a problem with a child feeling shame at all, actually. But I have a large problem, as most of us would, with shaming a child. There's a big difference between actively shaming and allowing a child to feel that that flush in the face and that kind of oh no, but story particularly bi biographical story. I think, Rebecca, you know much more about this than me, but um, certainly with the, with the adoptive situations that I've worked with, you get a chance to tell a little bit of your own story and your own struggles in a way that is highly relevant to the situation. W what do you think, Rebecca? Because you've got such a deep background in this. Do you, do you see that or maybe you see it differently? No, I, I agree completely. Um... I think especially for kids who are joining a family, they they lack that past with a family. So being able to share that this family they've come into isn't perfect and those parents that mm. they've joined aren't perfect. Um, so they also aren't expected to be perfect. Um, but that we have to also learn from our mistakes. Um, and then the child being able to tell their own story later on is is so important. Um, I, I do have a, a one author that I really love with some social skills kinds of things. Her name is Julia Cook. Um, she has a book specific to lying that's called Lying Up a Storm. And she has a whole series of books that are about different behaviors. Um, my boys love personal space camp because we have troubles with keeping our personal boundaries. Um, so she just has a lot of different books for different problematic behaviors. Um, I will, but, will link to that in the blog tomorrow. I will look up her books and link to it. I'm not familiar with them, and it surprises me because I love children's literature. I can't wait. <laughs> I'll look them up. It, you'll, you'll love them. Um, but I think if we can tell our own personal stories and then have some bedtime stories that are – paperback books or whatever, those can be helpful as well. But those personal stories are going to stick with the kids so much more. Um, the kids are going to say, remember when you told me what you did when you were little. And that gets those stories get told around our dinner table all the time about, <laughs> Dad, remember. I think, oh, why did we tell them that? But that shows them that we're not perfect and that they – are also going to make mistakes, but it didn't ruin our lives. So, 
Exactly. Another um, resource, by the way, one of my favorite books is a book by Susan Pero, uh, spelled P-E-R-O, E-R-O-W, Susan Pero. And she, her latest book is called Healing Stories for Challenging Behavior. And that's a wonderful resource as well, Susan Pero. Healing Stories for Challenging Behaviors. Okay, everyone, I will add both of these to the blog tomorrow, and uh, and I'll have links to them as well. I cannot wait. Um, those are both great resources. Let me take a moment to thank a few more of our gold sponsors and to remind you that this show would not exist without their support, as well as all the resources we provide at Creating a Family. We have independent adoption centers. Their mission is to provide open adoption placement and counseling to birth and adoptive families. They work with families in all 50 states. We also have Hopscotch Adoptions. They are a Hague-accredited adoption agency, placing waiting children from around the world, offering home study and post-adoption services to residents of North Carolina and New York. And one, we have Nightlight Christian Adoptions. They are a pioneer in offering embryo donation and adoption services to clients throughout the world through their Snowflakes Embryo Adoption Program. And the law offices of James Fletcher Thompson. They are a South Carolina firm committed to adoption and assisted reproductive law. Um, all right, now we're going to talk about, uh, we've talked some about, um, at what point, we've talked about typical behaviors that we, we'd see in a lot of children, um, the typical pattern of lying and, and, and things such as that. When should a parent become concerned? When when is the lying or the stealing indicative of something that's more than a typical developmental stage that we need to help our children work through? Rebecca? You know, I... There's a fine line between that. Um, I think a lot of times parents seek out help when they start to feel overwhelmed themselves, and that's a good time for them to seek out some help and some guidance um, because if they're feeling overwhelmed, then their child is going to know that they're feeling overwhelmed and out of control, um, and that's not going to make that child feel like they're in a safe, um, stable environment. Um, so if the parent is feeling very overwhelmed by the behavior, then by all means it's a time for them to seek out some guidance and assistance from a family therapist, from a social worker, from um, maybe them getting some parent consultation sessions. Um, if the child is showing no remorse or um, continuing to do things in more of a pathological way, um, which is also slightly hard to define depending on the age, um, then that would be a time to get that child into some therapy as well. Um, what are your thoughts, Kim? I know you've worked with a lot of families with these struggles too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah when, uh, when should we ratchet it up and, and get outside help for our children and for us? Well, you know, one of the things um, – one of the things that I've come to recognize over over the years is that all, all our kids have got quirks. I mean, you they've all got their own little quirks that make them lovable and um, infuriating as well. Um, and when they're under stress, that quirk slides along a spectrum and becomes a problem, a behavioral problem. When life slows down enough, exactly the same thing that's a problem, even a disorder, is actually a gift. The the same thing that, that can be the, the the disorder is actually their genius. And one of the things that that I've come to recognise in terms of when when something is happening that is causing concern is to see it as a spectrum. Like there is their little quirk. Their, their quirk might be to, that they like everything orderly. Um, and a, a number of, of children in adoptive situations go into that orderliness, like every, they need to know where everything is. All right, so that's their little quirk. But when life is, is booming and buzzing and coming at them too fast uh, and they need more space, they need more time, I've seen a number of children with that quirk of orderliness, needing everything to be ordered, actually start to become involved in stealing 
because they steal. And, and I remember actually seeing a child who all the whittling knives, there was a camp situation and all the whittling knives were disappearing. And when they were eventually found, this child had not only stolen them all, but had actually wrapped tape around them, had ordered them, had lined them all up. Now his quirk was he was a very orderly child, but because he was an adopted kid who was away on camp, it had really triggered his insecurities because he was very newly moved from a foster to an adoptive situation. And I had to recognize that first and foremost, actually, as a spectrum situation in that he had his, his spectrum had become, I call it a soul fever, it had almost become inflamed. And so we um, dialed down the number of activities he was doing per day in the camp and actually um, gave him a very targeted little job. He actually became one of the kitchen's kitchen assistants assistant. And he loved it. He totally loved it. He had something to do now. Not everything was changing. Much fewer transitions. And he not only um, gave everything back and um, with with you know with real with a real kind of contrite I'm sorry for doing that, but he's lining things up. Eventually, he was put in charge. At the, at the, at the royal age of ten. <laughs> was put in charge of, of making sure the cool rooms were all as they should be, all ordered, the big refrigerators, you know, were, everything was in its place. And so that very same thing that caused him to steal and lie about it, actually, when life calmed down, was his gift. And so for me, when something starts to become a pattern and you think, oh, no, you know, what's going on here? It's a major signal. To, to slow life down. And then if you do reach out to a professional for help, the professional will have much more of an idea of what's going on and will be able to see it more clearly um, when, the fa when the sort of static of too much too soon, too fast is quietened down. Then the advice you get will, will have a vessel to come into so to speak. So my first piece of advice when you think something is getting off the rails and you're starting to worry about it is slow down and understand the power of less. Yeah, I really love that. I love that phrase, the power of less. It's something that I, I truly believe in um, and, and implement in my own life as well as my, my parenting life. We have a question from someone talking, uh, asking, uh, it's long so I'm going to paraphrase, uh, basically, she wants to know uh, the effectiveness of having a child who has stolen something return it in person to the store or the person who they have stolen it from. Um, uh, I'd like to get both of your opinions on that. Uh, Rebecca, let's start with you. I would, I, I mean, I guess not knowing exactly the situation, my go-to answer is, Yes, to have them do that after they have done um, what Kim had talked about, that DADD situation, and then they're able to make amends to the person that they took it from. Um, after they have talked through what happened, they know that this is something that is not who they are, but is a behavior that they've had um, it's helpful if it's somebody in the family or somebody that they know who you can prep on an appropriate response. Um, if they're going to a store and they say, and if you do it again, I'm calling the cops, then that's not going to be as helpful to them because that's going to entice that fear response um, the next time. And there probably will be a next time. Um, if we're dealing with a repetitive behavior repetitious behavior, then there probably will be that next time. So we want them to be able to be honest and feel safe. Um, and we don't know a lot of um, our kids in foster care and adoptive, adoptive situations backgrounds. So we don't know what other threats they've received before they came into our homes. So if it's a positive right. situation, then go, go for it. Let them make those amends after they have done that processing with you as a supportive parent. You know, I would really agree wholeheartedly, Rebecca. That's just beautifully said because 
I, I just love the part that where you mentioned, and it will happen again, I, I, because it will. My my experience also is that if a child steals, or if a, if a child has certain uh, kids have certain patterns of of of, of pushback and fallback behaviour, they just do, and those patterns are repetitive. And the most important thing is if they do lie again, or if they do steal again, then when it happens, they know that they can make good. You you're actually establishing it's almost like you're putting soul arnica on this you're establishing a, a sort of a, the bruise the the, the 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 salve that you put on a, a behavioral bruise by actually going through that DADD principle um and and then you know doing i, I also like what, what you're saying rebecca about you do a little bit of a setup you do you actually contact the store owner and make sure they're not going to freak out and scare a child you know they're, they're not going to come down and, and make a child feel really really bad and force them backwards and and that would just mean the behavior will intensify not heal so you do that ahead of time and and then you know you might give a child a little bit not just returning the thing but they make something nice for the store they do something and, and here I'm not, um, making this one up but there was a couple of kids who actually together stole a whole bunch of candy bars and so they they returned what was left of the candy bars but this mother also had the children make a she asked them how could you make good and they made this really great little sign for all the different candies and so on and the prices and the store owner was as pleased as can be to put those signs there so it wasn't just uh, words I'm sorry or it wasn't just handing back the goods they actually brought their good will into action they did something and I was really really impressed with that mother and those children for thinking up that idea because that was the do-over which we're you know we've come back to a few times in this conversation the do-over was actually doing something not just talking yeah, making amends um, 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 but for, for in some way, making up for um, having caused harm or, or consternation or whatever. Yeah, I like that. I like that as well. Um, let me give you each uh, an opportunity for any sum up or any, any summary that you would like our audience to take uh, who, if they are facing children, which if they're parenting, they probably are, who have... Uh, Done one of the uh, who have engaged in one of the three stooges or, or any other uh, troublesome behavior that we parents tend to worry about. Rebecca, I'll give you the first uh, chance to sum up, and then uh, then come to you, Kim. You know, I think all of our kids have behaviors. It doesn't matter which background they come from, um, and they don't do things to irritate us as parents intentionally. They may do things to get our attention and show us that they need something else from us. But one of the things that we say a lot of times in our trainings is to remind parents, this isn't about you. This is about your child's needs. Um, And so trying to depersonalize these behaviors and look at it more as this is a need that my child's expressing. What can I do to meet that need instead of they're lying or they're stealing to make me look like an idiot? Mm -hmm. That's not what they're going into things for. So just really look at what your child is telling you through their behaviors instead of focusing so much on the behavior itself. Um, And I think you'll get very far with that. Um, but parenting is difficult, and every child is unique. Um, so go with God's grace in that. <laughs> Amen Indeed. on that one. All right, Kim, final thoughts. You know, just to build on what Rebecca, this, this is wonderful wise words of Rebecca just now, is that is that if we can look at our child in any range of behaviors and look at them, right in that moment, right in the moment that's going to define us as a parent. Because when we look back at our parenting, when we were parented, we might remember the nice things we did with our parents, but we sure remember the the, the times when there were problems and what happened to either have that be resolved in a good way or have have us be shamed. We, 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 you know, so... When a child does something that is clearly not okay and transgresses family values, is 
to, is to understand that that behavior, that that is our chance to clarify family values. Right in that, we can talk to our kids about you know, what our family stands for, and that's all good, you know, around the dinner table. It's a good thing to do that. But where the rubber hits the road of that, where it manifests practically, is when something goes wrong. And so when something goes wrong, if we can understand two simple things, the first thing is that when things go wrong, it gives us a chance to define our family. That's point number one. So discipline isn't, isn't a bad thing. Discipline comes from the, word of, uh, the, the same root word as disciple, to, to be followed, to be worthy of being followed. And if we want our children to follow us, then we have to be worthy of being followed. And in that moment when things are at their worst, how can we, when our kids are at their worst, how can we be at our best? And the, one of the ways to do that is to understand and to ask ourselves what I find is a hard but simple question. What do you need to orient yourself right now? You little rotter. <laughs> what, what do you, you know, you rascal. What do you need? What is it you need to orient yourself? Because that behavior comes out of disorientation. It doesn't, my child doesn't wake up in the morning thinking, hmm, I wonder how I can infuriate my mother today. I mean, they don't. They, they, they succeed. But, they, but it's in that flashpoint moment to ask oneself, what? Is it that you need to help you find your way back from feeling lost? You see, the moment we ask ourselves that question, we've not just helped the child, but we've moved ourselves into a different place within our being. We've moved ourselves into that place of the loving parent, even in the teeth of a, of, of a barefaced lie. Yeah, I think that is so. And redefining as it opposed to this child, which is what Rebecca was saying as well. This child mm -hmm. is not out to get us. This child is behaving for a reason. And and for us understanding that reason, um, how to orient a child who is feeling disoriented. Excellent. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Rebecca Rosema and Kim John Payne, for being our guests today on Creating a Family. If you want to participate in a discussion of the topics of this show, check out my blog tomorrow at Creating a Family. Dot org slash blog. To get more information about our guest, you can. Or we'll start with Rebecca. Rebecca Rosema. You can go to number one. You could go to our website and go to our service directory. Uh, Bethany is one of our sponsors, and you can scroll down, find Bethany, and uh, click on that. It will take you to their website, or their website is Bethany B E T H A N Y dot org, and you can get more information about Rebecca Rosema there. To get more information about Kim John Payne uh, and his books, you can go to his website, simplicityparenting.com. I even just like the name of that website. So you can go to either sim or to simplicityparenting.com to get more information about Kim Payne and his books. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I will see you next week. Now at the Home Depot, save up to 35% off appliance special buys, like the Samsung stainless steel side-by-side -side refrigerator, just $9.98. You save $300. It's big enough to hold 25 bags of groceries. Unload those, and if that makes you thirsty, you'll really love the external ice maker and water dispenser. Today is the day for doing. Spring Black Friday savings now at the Home Depot. More saving, more doing. U.S. only while supplies last. You store for details valid through April 17th. Now at the Home Depot, save up to 35% off appliance special buys, like the Samsung stainless steel side-by-side -side refrigerator, just $9.98. You save $300. It's big enough to hold 25 bags of groceries. Unload those, and if that makes you thirsty, you'll really love the external ice maker and water dispenser. Today is the day for doing. Spring Black Friday savings now at the Home Depot. More saving, more doing. U.S. only while supplies last. See store for details valid through April 17th.